I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story because I want to set up the context of where we're going with this word. Amen? Amen. The story we're about to read is about Jacob, Abraham's grandson. And this story takes place at a time in his life when he's been running. He's been running. Uh, he's constantly been on the run. God had made promises about his life. And you know, the Bible is full of promises for you and I, for the children of God. Amen? Amen. But Jacob has been in the habit of taking matters into his own hands. So many times God, in his word, has promises for us. But many times we don't want to submit. We don't want to bow the knee. Come on, somebody help me out here. I'm not the only one in here that's had a control problem, had a problem of releasing my life to the Lord and instead wanting to hold on to what I want to hold on to and do it the way that I want to do it. I'm not the only one. I know that this is a room full of people that have experienced what I'm talking about. Jacob is a perfect example for us to see ourselves in today. Instead of waiting on God, he schemes and deceives and he takes what he wants. We can't really say that he isn't a hard worker. You can't say that about Jacob. I mean, he proves himself about hard work. That's not a problem that he has. Nor can we say that he doesn't love God. Because there's more than one occasion where you can see in the midst of all this running, all this deceiving, and all this scheming, he loves the Lord. It's just that the place where Jacob has been living is that he loves what he wants more than he loves God's will. And his choices have kept him running. He ran from his twin brother Esau who wanted to kill him. And in the story we're about to read about his life, he's running from his father-in-law whose name was Laban. Who feels like Jacob has deceived him too. Truthfully, the whole time, whether he's running from Esau, whether he's running from Laban, he's really running from the Lord. Amen. One of the most awesome truths in this story that stuck out the most to me was the fact that in all Jacob's deceit and attempts to grab what he wants the way he wants to do it. In all his running, God still wants to help him. I mean, the first verse we're about to read in Genesis 32, verses 1 through 11. You can go ahead and put it up there on the screen. In the first verse we're about to read, the Lord, the Bible says that Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. In the midst of all that running, in the midst of all that stuff that he was doing and all the trouble that he was causing. We're about to read it. I just wanted to make the point. In the midst of all that, God still was there with him. God still Amen. wanted to bring him through. Amen? Amen? See, the enemy's a master at whispering in your ear and telling you you've gone too far this time. He's a master at whispering in your ear and telling you, heaping condemnation and guilt on your back. And I'm here to tell you that the devil is a liar. He speaks one language. It's lies. It's lionese, if there's such a thing. That's what he speaks. He's the father of lies, and that's all he speaks. And he constantly tries to speak deception, and he will constantly try to get you to feel overwhelmed with guilt and a burden of, of, of hopelessness. But I'm here to tell you, that's not the Lord. Amen. The Lord wants to get you through. The Lord still wants to protect him because God's purposes and his plans for salvation. Listen, this is important for us to get a hold of this. God's purposes and plans for salvation is that, that the salvation of the human race, God has chosen to use his people yes. to reach out yes. to those that are lost. I can't go on until I, I get that point across to you. You got a purpose, amen? amen? And your purpose isn't just showing up over here on Sunday. Listen, from the day that we started this church, we preached this way. Some pre churches won't preach this way, but we're going to preach the truth because it makes people sometimes feel uncomfortable. And that's why you need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life because you can't do it on your own. You got to be filled up with the Holy Spirit in order to do what God's called you to do. What has God called me to do, preacher? To be a light in the midst of darkness, to let the light of Jesus shine out out of you so that other people can see and have hope in the midst of this lost and dying world. Because listen to me, if all of us have felt like Jacob has felt and all of us haven't been running, we need to be able to hear. Those people need to be able to hear the truth of the gospel. Amen. Praise God. Let's start reading in Genesis chapter 32. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 first. It says that Jacob went on his way. This is after he's leaving his father-in-law Laban's house. And the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. In other words, God's army. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. You know, that I'm going to probably just stop every now and then. I'm not, not going to overdo it, but stop every now and then and, and kind of explain a little bit. This word Mahanaim means two camps. Now, Jacob later on is going to split his, 
his people into two camps. But really the idea here is that Jacob got a glimpse of the angels of God, the army of God, the host of God. And Jacob's like, in this place, there's two camps. There's my camp, but there's God's camp. You need to know, I need to know, and be reminded that while we're on this journey in life, God is with you, amen? God's supernatural power and protection is with you along the way. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. He's basically saying, he's looking at Esau, he's submitting himself. He's calling him Lord, meaning master. You know, he wants to submit himself. Esau's his older brother, his older twin brother. We'll talk about that in a second, but he's trying to humble himself. Okay, and we'll explain that in a little bit. Thy servant Jacob says thus, I have sojourned or I've been on a journey with Laban and I stayed there until now and have oxen and asses and flocks and, and, and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find, find grace in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and uh oh, he also comes to meet you and 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, meaning destroy it, meaning attack it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto your country and to your kindred, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have showed unto your servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, talking about the Jordan River, and now I have become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. Mm. Now Genesis chapter 32, verses 13 through 18. And he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. And this was the present. 200 she goats, 20 he goats, 200 ewe lambs, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 uh, forms of cattle and 10 bulls. 20 she asses or donkeys and 10 foals of the 10 children of the uh, donkeys. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants every drove by themselves. What is a drove? It's a group. It's like a herd. So he divided them up and, and, and he every drove by themselves and said unto his servants, pass over before me and put a space between drove and drove. So you got you got you lambs, you got she goats, you got milk camels, and they're all separated and they're going one after the other in a line. And it says, and he commanded the foremost saying, when he saw my brother meets thee and asks thee saying, whose art thou and where are you going and whose are these before you? Then you shall say, they be your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent under you, my Lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. Now we're going to Genesis 32 verses 22 through 28 because we're reading the whole story. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the Ford Jabbok, which is another word for a small river. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. So he sent his wives and the children across and Jacob was left alone. And there he wrestled a man. Now, I need you to understand something that this man right here is no, no, none other than the Lord. Yes. Whether you want to say the Lord showed up like an angel, some people, some scholars would say that this was what you'd call a Christophany, which means that Jesus showed up in the Old Testament. Whatever you want to call it, God appeared to Jacob as a man and in a physical wrestling match ensued on this night when Jacob was left alone. And there he wrestled with a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, talking about the man, who was wrestling with, with Jacob, when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. In other words, the, what the King James is saying is that he touched him in his hip. And, 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 his, and his thigh was out of joint. 
And as he wrestled with him and he said, let me go for the day breaks. That's the Lord saying, the, the Lord that's wrestling with him. He said, I will not let thee go unless you bless me. Jacob's holding on to the Lord. Jacob don't even know what he needs right now. I'm here to tell you. Jacob's been running. Jacob's been lying. Jacob's been deceiving. But Jacob knows that he's been in a wrestling match. And now whenever the day breaks about to come and whoever this is, Jacob's been wrestling with. And he's about to leave and Jacob grabs a hold of him. He claims to him. He says, oh, no, I'm not letting go until you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? Now, this is the Lord talking to Jacob. And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. One more verse, chapter 32, verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted or limped upon his thigh. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to preach this message, Lord, the way that you gave it to me. I pray that the anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord, would reach deep down inside of all of our hearts, Lord God, and that you'd speak to us about your truth in Jesus' name. I've titled my message this morning, How Long Will You Wrestle With God? You know, it's been pointed out before uh, that there are approximately 12 chapters in Genesis devoted to, to Abraham. Abraham was Jacob's uh, grandfather, and there, there's approximately 32 chapters devoted to Jacob. One thought connected to this truth is that salvation happens quickly, but sanctification is a process that takes time in the life of the believer. Don't get, don't get nervous. I'm going to break down these words for you, too, because, you know, I used to be in the church, and whenever I'd say these words, the preacher used to fuss at me. You can't say justification. You can't say sanctification. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, dude, because they're in the Bible, and people need to know it. And so I've learned that we're going to say them, because they're not just church words, they're Bible words, but we also got to break them down, and we got to understand. I want you to know that Abraham is a type of salvation. He's a type of justification. According to Romans and Galatians, we learn that fact that when we get saved, we're made righteous. That was the promise that God gave to Abraham. If you've never read it before, it's an amazing thing that 2,000 years before Jesus would ever come on the scene, God gave a promise to Abraham, and the promise was ultimately that Jesus would come and that Jesus would bring us righteousness. Now listen to me. I, I, I don't plan. It's not, that's why I preach so long, because I don't ever plan on doing this. But, but this is what we're going to do. We got people getting rid of Sunday school, but we're going to just mix it all together. Y'all okay? Y'all yes. with me? All right. So what I need you to know is, and, I, and for you that have seen this before, before, you can just take a nap if that's what you need to do. But there was a time frame before there was ever a nation known as Israel. Did you know that if you turn on CNN today, you'll see the fact that there's a nation called Israel? Yeah. Did you know that? Does that not at least spark some attention from you? I mean, I talk to people all the time about the Lord. And I'm like, what are you going to do with that? You don't believe in God? Okay. Well, there's still a nation called Israel. There's a biblical testimony that talks about the fact that God created this nation for himself. Amen? And what the Bible says is, so before there was a nation called Israel, there was a whole bunch of, we'll use the word Gentile nations. Because we're going to say that word in a little bit. What is a Gentile? A Gentile is any person that wasn't from Israel or wasn't a Jew. Is there any people that are born Jews in here this morning? <laughs> Anybody at all? Because there might be. No? No born Jews? So that means we're all Gentiles. We were all born of another culture, of another race, of another uh, place. All right? And so, but the Bible says that God called a man named Abraham out from amongst all these nations. He said, hey, Abraham. Abraham, come out of your father's house and I'm going to make you a great nation. And so God pulled this man named Abraham out and he promised that through Abraham, all the seed, all the people, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Now, that's the blessing of Abraham. That's the promise of Abraham. And so through Abraham, God created another country, his own country. And this country... Its name was Israel. But listen, there's hundreds of years that have to take place through that. But ultimately, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They were the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which we just read in this story. And through this people group, God grew them in Egypt and they left in the Exodus and they wandered in the wilderness and then he put them in their own land and they grew to a great 
nation, right? Yes. And then ultimately, 2,000 years after the promise, hallelujah, guess what happened? God took a man out of there and he gave us Jesus. Amen. The Bible says that, that that was the promise. That Jesus, not seeds as though it was the whole nation of Israel, but one seed, the book of Galatians says, who was Jesus. And then Jesus died on the cross. He took his holiness. He took his sinlessness. He died on the cross. And he paid the penalty for the sins of the entire human race. Y'all not get tired of hearing me say that. He died for the sins of the entire human race. And that message has been going forward since that time. It was promised beforehand, way over here before there ever was a nation. Really, way over there, right after the fall. It was promised beforehand, and now it's continued to be promised. And people have been looking backwards on what Jesus did at the cross for all these thousands of years. And when that word is preached, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means good news, and a hearing heart hears it and responds by faith, like I told you last week, and I'll probably tell you every week, then whenever you believe in, by faith in what God has provided, his son Jesus dying on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin, then the old man that was born like Adam, yes. the old man named Jacob, dies with Jesus, is buried with him, and a new man is resurrected to newness of life. 12 chapters about Abraham, because listen, when you got saved, everybody in here saved, I hope you are. If not, you can get saved today. Amen. When you got saved, it happened like that. Amen. I'm telling you right now, you heard the gospel message. I mean, it might have taken a little time for people to work on you, for the Lord to work on you. But my point is, when you said, yes, God, spiritually, immediately, miraculously, you got saved. 12 chapters. Amen. It happens like that. Representative of Abraham, 32 chapters of Jacob, sanctification. What does sanctification mean? It means the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That means, oh, preacher, uh, why you was, why you was uh, still dipping after 12 years of Christianity? Because I was being like Jacob. And because don't think that the Lord wasn't dealing with me. Don't get mad at me now if I'm preaching the truth. I, I don't have to sit here and prove what's true to you. Because the truth of the matter is, is that if you're doing something that the Lord doesn't want you to do, he's already told you long before anybody else came around here trying to say anything. And I can tell you right now, I was struggling. I was frustrated, man. I'd be off strong. I'd throw that whole roll of dip in the gulf. I called my wife up and I'd say, send some more out here. Because I was trying to do it in my own strength. It was when I finally surrendered that the Lord gave me the victory that I was wanting. Man, I used to live in so much fear, man. I don't mean to be gross, but I'd pull my lip down. I'd look in the mirror, and it was all messed up looking. I was like, oh, Lord, I'm going to die. Something bad's going to happen to me. Lord, help me. And I'd get it, you know, throw it away again. Next, you, you get my point. Yeah. Struggling. Ongoing walk with God in our life, where the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives. And causing us to look more and more like the Lord. And listen, to be honest with you, dipping that that I realized that late, you know, later, that was just something that the Lord was dealing with me about. He was a whole lot more worried about my bad attitude. Right, right. He was a lot more worried about the way I talk yeah. to folks. Yeah. Yep. About the way I handle my business. Yeah. About the way I you know what I'm saying? The way the, the, the way I, I, I did things on a daily basis. God was much more worried. He wants to get on the inside. He wants to teach me humility. He wants to teach me how to walk with him and to look more like him so that people will want to know the Jesus that I talk about. Yeah, that's right. Jacob's life is undoubtedly a story that reflects the sanctification of the New Testament believer. The ongoing struggle, the process by which God changes the life of the Christian. Hey, can you put... Uh, Romans 15, 16 up, because I, I was going to use this scripture real quick to just try to describe a little bit more about the meaning of sanctification. I, I like this scripture. I like to break stuff down, right? So look right here what it says. That I should be, this is the Apostle Paul preaching or, or writing, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So what, what does that mean? Well, I just explained earlier that Gentiles were people that weren't Jews, right? So Jesus was born a Jew. Jesus was from Israel. The first people that the gospel was preached to were Jews. 
And the first people they got saved were Jews. But then the gospel began to spread outward to all those other people that didn't know God. People that lived in Corinth and people that lived in Greece and people that lived in Rome. All over the gospel began to spread. And the Apostle Paul is saying that God called me to preach Jesus to those other people out there. To minister the gospel of God. Look at this. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. What does that mean, offering up of the Gentiles? In other words, it's kind of like your life, these Gentiles' lives that Paul's talking about, are offered up to God as an act of worship. Look at these people, God, that have given their life unto you. God called Paul to preach the gospel so that Gentile people would hear the truth, give their life to God, and that now they would be acceptable unto God. How were they made acceptable? Because they were sanctified by the Holy Ghost. What I need you to know this morning is this. Sanctification is done through the way the gospel works. Once again, the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. The hearer hears the word. He surrenders by faith. He gives his heart to Jesus. He says, yes, I'm a sinner, Lord, but I believe, Father, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And when you say it and you mean it, the Holy Spirit now comes and lives in you. Hallelujah. And now you're sanctified because, look, now there's all kind of people that are getting saved in Christ. Amen. See what I'm saying? It started off, there was no Israel. God created Israel out of one man named Abraham. And out of Abraham, he gave us Jesus. And in Jesus, he's creating a new people called the church, the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And new people are getting born again, Gentiles, Jews. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and so, and you're being separated out, separated out from the rest of the world. Because look at this. If we're going to be real about it, all this is taking place within a bigger place. You see this? Because this is this right here. Jesus showed up in the midst of darkness. You get the point. I'm running out of chalk. Jesus showed up in the midst of darkness. In the middle of a darkened world full of people that did not know God, Jesus showed up. And now as people are being born again, I said it last week, there's two kingdoms that coexist on the earth. There's the kingdom of the Antichrist, the kingdom of the enemy, the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And you're either in one or the other, and you're trying to live in both at the same time like Jacob was, and it doesn't work like that. Yeah, that's right. Listen to me, everything that you connect yourself to about the world is going to try to influence you to be more like the world and less like Jesus. Amen. You do what you want with that, but that's just the truth. <laughs> Music, Hollywood. Oh, here he goes again. Well, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I don't ever watch TV, and I'm not going to tell you that I don't watch movies, but I'm going to tell you right now. I can see it left and right, how Hollywood, how all of these shows are trying to slowly uh, cause us to believe their agenda, cause us to believe what they're trying to say society is supposed to look like. And all I'm telling you is this. When you read this book right here, when you start to learn what the Lord says, he says, my kingdom looks different than that kingdom. Hallelujah. And you can't live in both. And you'll never be able to be the light that God's called you to be if you're trying to live in both places at the same time. Yeah. Sanctified, separated out, made holy by the Holy Spirit. I got good news for you, you see, because look, whenever you get saved, you're immediately sanctified. Immediately. Praise God. It's called positional sanctification. That means when you get saved, you're in Christ. He took you out of the world and he put you in Jesus. Yeah. Because of your faith, because now the Father sees you, He doesn't see you as a sinner, He sees you covered under the blood of Jesus. You've already been made holy because you chose the way of the Father. But like Brother Larson used to say all the time, your position is much higher than your condition. In other words, you're in Christ, the Father sees you as holy, if you, if you die today, see, I used to look, and, and, and if you don't like this preaching, you came to the wrong church. I used to go to a church where they said, oh, you didn't make it on Wednesday night. Well, you know what? You ain't going if the rapture comes. Hold on a second, man. I might have the flu. What are you, you, know, what are you talking about? No. I want you to come to church. Please come to church. It'd be boring, me preaching to myself. But what I will tell you is this. That ain't the truth. 
It's not how much you go to church that makes you righteous in the eyes of God. It's not how much you pray that makes you righteous in the eyes of God. It's not how much you read the Bible that makes you righteous in the eyes of God. It's what Jesus did when he hung naked on the cross and he bore your sin upon him. And when you put faith in that, the great exchange took place. He took your personal guilt and he gave you his personal righteousness. Hallelujah. And now you're walking in the righteousness of God. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Sanctified to purify, free from guilt, to separate from profane things. There's an immediate aspect to sanctification, what I just talked about, but there's also a progressive process of sanctification. You know where the Holy Spirit's working in your life and He's dealing with you about things. He's showing you things, and then we're like Jacob, and we don't want to let go, right? But then he's going to bring you to a place. I'm telling you right now. You know I'm telling you the truth. God, if you belong to the Lord, he ain't going to quit on you. He's not going to let go. He won't take his hand off of you, and he's going to let you go ahead and ride until one day you're going to feel that cord tighten up, right? And you're not going to be able to run as fast as you used to run because he's slowing you down. He's allowed, he's orchestrated some events in your life. He's allowed some things to take place to get you to the place where he wants you to be so that he can show you and speak to you and get you to willingly bow your knee. That's progressive sanctification, the process where the life begins to look less like the old man who was born of Adam and more like the new man born again of God. Let's look at that real quick. Uh, Ephesians 4 verses 20 through 24. The old man versus the new man. Now he's writing to the church of Ephesus. The Ephesians. I know that this probably doesn't really matter that much to, to, to a lot of people, but <clears throat> this is this is supposed to be Israel right here. This is this is uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and then there was a something called an isthmus of land called Asia Minor that was up here. And in this isthmus of land called Asia Minor, there was a city called Ephesus. And that's who Paul is writing to. My point is, this is Israel down here. This is where the Jewish people are from. These people are Gentiles up here. Paul was called to the Gentiles. He's writing a letter to the church of Ephesus. And he goes on to talk about the fact that in their previous life, they lived a certain way. They followed after false gods. They lived, they lied. They, They had sex with whoever they wanted to have sex with. They did whatever it is that they wanted to do. Am I preaching to anybody in here? Because I sure enough preach it to myself. Yeah. And, but now the, the Apostle Paul says, but you're different now. Yeah. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. In other words, that's not what the, if you know Jesus, that's not what you're being taught from Jesus. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Look at this. That you put off concerning the, the former conversation. That word conversation means your lifestyle. Yes. That you put off your old lifestyle, which was the old man, and was corrupt according to deceitful lust, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You need your mind cleaned up. You need your mind cleansed. You need the word of God and the spirit of God over a process of time, because it ain't going to happen overnight, friend. Over a process of time to change you on the inside, to change your way of thinking. Amen? Amen. To cha- I know that I'm probably like I'm a very um, non-traditional preacher, you know? Yeah, it's a good thing, I think. But I mean, it might offend some people. But like sometimes I go to the gym and yesterday I went to the gym and I remembered my earphones and I listened to preaching all day. And that was a good day. Sometimes I forget my earphones, though, so I'm learning all these songs. I ain't going to lie to you, you know? And now this, I think that this new hot person is Cardi B or something. And she's like, I ain't going to repeat, repeat exactly what she said, but she's like, I run this thing like cardio, you know? And so then, so what I'm trying to say is, what she, what she trying to say? I run my business like I got, like I ain't got no shame to my game. And this is how I run my business. I'll step on your neck to get wherever I'm going to go. That's the world, man. That's the world system talking about, I'm going to take what's mine. That's Jacob's spirit. That's something that's of the world. You're not going to 
to learn that from God. John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Ghost to do the ministry and prepare the way before the Lord, said, I must decrease so that he might increase. But the world loves them some Cardi B. The world loves, oh yeah, because Cardi, I don't even know what she looks like, but I'm sure she got all kind of bling. I'm sure she drives nice car. She probably got a Rolls Royce, that girl making so much money. She got a big old mansion. You probably walk in there, she got a sauna. She got a wine cellar. She got an old theater room. And if you walk, she probably got an elevator in her house. And if you walked in there, you'd be like, oh man, Cardi B got it going on. Look at her high heels. They made up, they got some real gold on them shoes. And you'd be like all impressed. Oh man, Cardi B, she's this, she's that. But Cardi B gonna die and go to devil's hell if somebody don't tell her about Jesus. The Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet he loses his own soul? And enemies deceiving humanity. And they just moving in the wrong direction. And they just believe in all of that. Yes. Like you ain't running nothing like cardio, girl. You about to die. Lord, help her. Help Cardi B, Lord. Put off the former conversation, the old man. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what I was getting at whenever I went on that rabbit trail. <laughs> we can still be in the church and we think when we hear Cardi B talking about, man, I run this thing like cardio, you know, and I'm lightening it up for you a little bit. You know, like, oh, yeah, that's how I need to run my business. No, that ain't how you run your business. Come right, on. Right. Ask, ask Robert and Wade. Praise God. I don't mean to call them out. But just, just let the Lord have his way. Amen. God will give you a supernatural explosion. Does it always work exactly like that? No, because sometimes God ain't ready to give us what we think we're ready for. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. Sometimes people all oh, like they, they over there like the prosperity preacher. Let me watch this prosperity preacher. And I'm like, I'm going pull on the, on the jackpot and I'm going to get the jackpot. Let me give a hundred dollars and I'm about to get a thousand back in the mail. That ain't how God works. That's pridefulness. God wants us to learn how to be humble. God wants to work some things in the middle of our lives. The narrative of Jacob's life reflects this truth that his sinful and selfish character was revealed immediately, even in his physical birth. If you read the story of Jacob's physical birth, the, he was a twin. His brother Esau came out first. You know what the Bible says? Jacob had a hold of his brother's heel. Amen. That's what his name means. It means heel grabber, heel snatcher. And supplanter. It means, supplanter means somebody that's trying to take the place of somebody else. Mm -hmm. See, God had a plan for Jacob's life. God knew beforehand, and see, tells us this in the New Testament, that Esau was going to hate the things of God. Mm -hmm. Because of that, God had a plan to give everything to Jacob. But Jacob, from the get-go, because of his first birth in Adam, first birth in sin, because of the carnal nature already at, at his physical birth, trying to grab a hold yeah. and take things by force and do it the way that he wants to do it instead of let God have his way in Jacob's life. Because of his actions, he was named Jacob. Amen. And while it was God's will for Jacob to receive the birthright because Esau wasn't interested, <coughs> Jacob did it himself and he lived a life of deception. He deceived his brother Esau. We don't have time to get into it, but he, he deceived his brother Esau into selling him his birthright. He deceived his father Isaac into giving him Esau's blessing. I mean, I'll tell you a little bit of that one. His daddy was getting old and couldn't see anymore. And, and his daddy said, told Esau, because he was the oldest, and so that was how they did it. They, they blessed the oldest. He said, go, go hunt because Esau was a hunter. And the Bible says Jacob was a homeboy. He stayed home with his mom. But that's what the Bible teaches. But Esau was a, was a man's man and he was a hunter. And, 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 and Isaac said, go get me one of them, some venison. Go get me one of them deers and cook it up for me like I love. And then I'm going to bless you. Well, as soon as Esau runs out the door, his mama was listening at the curtain and she told Jacob, she said, Jacob, go get and kill one of them goats. I'm going to cook it up like your daddy likes it and we're going to trick him into thinking it's you that he's giving the blessing to. And Jacob's like, oh, no, mama. He's like, I, 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 I'm, I'm a smooth man. I don't have no hair on my body. My brother's all hairy and my daddy's going to know. He's going to know I'm deceiving him. And she said, don't worry about that, Jacob. I got you covered. I'm going to make you like a little fur sleeve out of that goat after we kill it. We're going to trick him. And sure enough, that's what they did. They made a first sleeve and, and tricked Isaac into giving the blessing yeah. to Jacob. So he was, he was fearful that, that he was going to get busted. But once his mama came up with the plan, 
He was ready to go in. So I just want you to know he was deceptive and he was trying to get things done his own way. This is a common aspect, you know. Well, since this happened, where we were reading is in this portion of Jacob's life is where he's coming to the end. He's coming to the end of all this. All of his days of deception and doing things his own way instead of God's ways have piled up and are now bringing him to a place where he must quit running and surrender to God. Listen, when that went down in the house that day and Esau found out about it, he said, he said, I'm going to wait till my daddy dies. And then once my daddy dies, then he said, then I'm going to get a hold of my brother and, and I'm going to kill him. Mm -hmm. Rebecca heard that, too. And she said, Jacob, you need to go. <laughs> and he did. He took off and he ran. And he's been gone 21 years now. He served seven years for one of them daughters. We ain't going to get into that. There's a whole other message and all that. He served another seven years for another daughter. And he served another seven years for, for all of the, the livestock that he was leaving with. Jacob earned 21 years. And now the Lord was telling them it was time to go back home. But now you got to go face some stuff. And this is a common aspect of the life of all believers in relation to their willingness to surrender to God. The burden of trying to serve God while at the same time attempting to live life and do business our own way results in a burden that becomes unbearable. And, 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 at a, and, a, and a breaking that leads either to change or to destruction. The Bible says that the fool is one who is corrected often by God, yet he stiffens his neck and it leads to destruction. Sadly, the truth is, is that people have a free will. I mean, it's a good thing. God blessed us with a free will. But many times we just refuse. We refuse to submit. Point number one. Y'all ready? Man always has his own plan. Genesis 32 verses 6 through 8. It says, And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau. And he also comes to meet you and 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands and said, if Esau comes to the one company and smites it, then the other company, which is left, shall es escape. You know, there's a constant struggle in the life of the believer. Faith versus flesh. Yeah. Satan will always attempt to get us to take matters into our own hands. And remedy our own situations based on what seems smart logically yeah. or according to the natural order. I use this as an example and I've used it before because sometimes I try to make things a little bit, a little bit more real, right? But sometimes like just say for instance financially, and listen, a lot of people have done this so don't think that I'm picking on you because this is something that a lot of people end up doing. So I don't, I ain't picking on your business. I'm just trying to tell you that this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. I got some financial situation going on, right? I got a financial situation going on and I need money. And so I don't really know what to do, but I know that if I don't make a move or if something doesn't happen, it's about to get worse. So what do I do? What should I do? I should stand still and, and cry out to the Lord that he would, uh, do, move in my circumstance and then even though it may look like everything's falling down around me I know I'm preaching big right now I got a, I got a wall and I got a roof right now but even though it looks like everything's falling down around me I have to believe that the Lord's going to be there and he's going to open up a door amen to take care of me it may not look the way I want it to look Right. But I got to be able to trust God that he will show up, whether it's getting me another job, a better job, whether it's like, like I got to go move back in with my mama for a period of time. I don't know what exactly it looks like or live somewhere where I don't really want to live that I can afford till I learn how to save. Right. Because all that's biblical. Being a good steward, be, you know what I'm saying? Not, not owing people money and, and living in debt. But what, what does the flesh want to do? We go to the payday loan place. Go to the payday loan, give, give, give me a little loan real quick, then what happens? Oh, Lord, I don't even know how much interest them people charge. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that it's flesh versus faith. And the enemy is always trying to say, you need to take the quick way out. And the Lord's saying, no, you got to bow, you got to submit, you got to surrender, you got to trust me in the midst of all of this. Man always has a plan. 
Jacob hears that is that he's about to run into his brother. He's like, oh, Lord, let me start splitting all this stuff up. Let me give him a big old gift. Let the gift go before him. Let me soften his heart up. Let me figure out a way to get this taken care of. Right. But the truth is, you can't figure it out in the natural. You can't figure it out. Logically, walking with God is a walk of faith. The very definition of faith is Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. It says this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't see God physically. You can't. The very definition of faith requires that we trust in what we cannot see. We can't see God, and oftentimes we can't see how in the world God will accomplish what we need done. But when we get caught in a pinch, we often find ourselves like Jacob, trying to make some carnal plan to alleviate our problems instead of trusting that the Spirit of God will go before us and remedy our situation. The proverb says in 1412, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Listen, even you might even try to go get wisdom from a man on the outside. Sometimes even people that are in the church and they mean well, but they give you this wisdom based on what seems logical and what makes sense in the, in the natural. And, and it's all messed up. I wish I had time to tell you all again the story about when I almost took that job 20 years ago. And I was getting counsel from the preacher. I was getting counsel from a brother-in-law. I was like, come on, man, it's a no-brainer. $10,000 more a year is what the people are wanting to pay you. Well, let me just tell you this. Within one year, that whole clinic was shut down. Now that whole hospital shut down. Whoa. And I, I mean, to, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Praise God. Praise God. I'm not going to get into the rest of it. How the blessings started flowing. Amen. I had to humble myself because I've already put in my notice. I had already put in my two month notice. Right, right. <laughs> I had to humble myself and go back to them doctors and say, hey, Dr. Clark said I could stay. I don't want to go. Y'all, y'all been really treating me pretty good. And you know what? Th God can work with humility. Amen. Amen. You know Amen. what I'm saying? Sometimes we just gotta learn how to lower ourselves a little bit. I, I still need to learn that in other areas. Amen. Amen. Don't think I'm, I'm not trying to act like I've arrived. Lord knows I haven't. Y'all see, even seen me exhibit prideful <laughs> behavior up in the church. Lord help me. Amen. All right. But there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. Jacob had a plan to give Esau gifts in hopes that this would soften Esau's heart and Jacob's life would be saved. But look what Esau says at first. When Jacob offers this, look at this, Genesis 33, verses 8 through 9. And he said, this is Esau talking. What do you mean with all this drove or all this herd which I met? And he said, these are to find grace in your sight, my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. <laughs> Keep what you have for yourself. You know what's so cool? I mean, Jacob ends up talking him into taking it. But you know what's so cool to me is that it is so obvious that God went before Jacob and already was dealing with Esau's heart. Yeah, amen. Because you know, now to be fair to Jacob, he went to the Lord in prayer. When he knew he was about to run into Esau, he went to the Lord in prayer. And he's like, God, I need some help. You said that if I went back to my people, you were going to take care of me. Amen. I need you to go before me. And, go, and the Lord did. The Lord went before him and began to work on, uh, on Esau's heart. Listen, we're getting to point number two. Point number one was, every man has a plan. Point number two, simple word, emptiness. It says in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 23, he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two woman servants and his 11 sons, and he passed over the ford Jabbok, and he took them and sent them over the brook. Jacob sends his family and his possessions across the Jabbok River, and he will soon also cross over on his journey, but not before he's broken. Listen, I want you to see this. This is a uh, this was a, a river off to the side here. The the the, uh, the Javik, the the Yarmouk, and the Anon rivers. Three three rivers that dumped into the Jordan River. They emptied themselves into the Jordan. Jacob's going to cross over and he, he's going to cross over. The name of Jabbok means emptiness. That's the literal name. Jacob had to cross over into a place of emptiness, but before he could ever get there, the truth is, is that he had to have his encounter with the Lord. We will have to become convinced and weary from the failure. Listen, there comes a place in our walk with God where we have to be emptied of self. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Self wants to lift 
lift itself up. Self is so full of pride. Self wants to aggrandize and, and wants everybody to notice. I, I, don't tell me that it's not true. Listen, I, maybe y'all don't have that problem. Maybe I'm the only one with that problem. But I can remember even after I understood the message of the cross. Some of you might not even know what I'm talking about. But even after I understood the message of the cross. I can remember sitting inside. And I know I've shared this before. Inside a service. And, and, and hearing the preacher preach. And thinking in my heart. I could do a better job than him. <laughs> and you know what the Lord did? The Lord said, what in the world? Are you, what is that? That ain't me. That's not me talking like that inside of you. That's something else. That's some stuff that needs to come out of you. That's envy, jealousy, pride, arrogance. Not to mention the fact that I really couldn't preach better than the guy. <laughs> I can remember Brother Bob Cornell. I mean, that was one of Naya's professors. Well, before, I didn't even know who Bob Cornell was. I mean, I grew up on Lauren Larson. I was there before Bob was ever even at the, at the ministry. I'm just telling you, I, I shared this with Brother Bob at dinner. He laughed. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I was listening. I grew up on Lauren Larson's Oaks, you know, and I'm like, and I could hear Sean and Robert because I couldn't catch the radio station for a period of time at home. And I'm like, I don't know who this Lauren Larson is, but I, you know, I, I learned, I learned from, I mean, I don't know who this Bob Cornell is. Well, anyway, one day I showed up at a camp meeting and, and he spoke a word and, it, and the Lord used it to give me great revelation of an answer that I had been looking for. It's almost like the Lord had locked it and waited for a period of time. And then boom. And it, and it just was like, oh my gosh. That was, and it wasn't even that. But it was deep. But it was like but the Lord had locked my mind. And you know what the Lord said? I just taught you something from that man. How, what you think about that? You know, that's who Bob Cornell is. He's a servant of mine that I've called, amen, to teach and to preach the gospel. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that many times we're walking around so full of self that we can't even see where we need to be. God's desiring to empty us. Jacob had to cross over a place that was called emptiness and then to get to the place where he needed to be. He, we, sometimes we're walking around so full of ourselves and so, so trying so hard to carry the burden of everything on us that we get worn out. Yeah. In the middle of it all, I need you to know that when we're in the struggle with God, sometimes we get worn out and we've been laboring and we're carrying this burden and, and, and God's trying to get us to the place where we're, where we're not only willing to empty ourselves of ourselves, <laughs> but where we're willing to unladen the burden that's on our back. That's what Jesus said. You don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 11, 28 through 29, he said, come unto me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your weary souls. Yeah. Amen. That's what the word labor means. It means to be fatigued to the point where you can't hardly go on no more. That's what's going on with Jacob's life. He needs to empty himself of himself. He needs to empty himself of all of this work that he's trying to do. For sake of time, I'm skipping the scripture. And I'm moving on to, to, to point number three. The change. <laughs> Amen. We need to get to the place of change. Amen. Jacob, Jacob came to the place of emptiness and we need to get to the place of change. In Genesis chapter 32 verses 24 through 28. The scripture says Jacob was left alone. And there he wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. And he wrestled with him and he said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let thee go except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. I titled this point, the change. See, Jacob's been wrestling with God. It's all going down tonight in this one night. I don't know about you, but I've had a moment like this with God. I've had a moment like this with God where everything really, I had been struggling, trying to carry the burdens, all of this stuff, and, and really try, not want to let go completely and to surrender and to trust God. And I had an encounter with the Lord, a wrestling match with God, and like a, I'm going to be honest with you, like a broken little baby curled up in a fetal position in my bed, cried and cried and cried and said, Lord, I am nothing but a miserable mess. I need you to do a work in me. I need you to change me, Lord. I need you to, to do what needs to be done in me, God. Yes. 
Jacob had been wrestling with God and God could not prevail. God couldn't prevail against him. I don't know about you, but I'm like, what? What you talking about? God couldn't prevail against a man. God is God. You know, I'm like, Lord, what does this mean? This is what I feel like the Lord showed me. It's not God can overcome any man. But sometimes man won't let God prevail in his life. Sometimes man refuses to let God prevail. And God could not prevail against Jacob because up until that moment in time, Jacob refused to empty himself and Jacob refused to be broken and to surrender to God. And so and when it's all said and done, the Lord asks Jacob, what is, after he's touched him, he touched him in his thigh. And he says, what is your name? Jacob, deceiver, supplanter, heel snatcher. That's not your name anymore, son. Your name now is Israel. Prince of God. One who will rule with God. When I came here, when we first started, one of the comments that I made was, and I told you this, and it was the Holy Spirit because it wasn't in my notes, that if we don't get anything else, you need to understand that God has chosen to use his people called by his name to allow his light to shine through. The Bible says that one day we will be priests and kings and we will rule with him. Today is the dress rehearsal for eternity. What I'm here to tell you is this, is that God, hallelujah, wants to change our name. He wants us to go from being Jacob and he wants to make us worthy in Christ with the grace of God, amen, to be strengthened to do the will of God. All of his life, he was fighting against God. God knew what type of blessing Jacob needed. Jacob needed a name change. He needed a character change. That's what the Bible, in the Bible, the name was connected to the character of the person. And so God changed his name to Prince of God, one who will rule with God. Look at, put 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 5, verse 17 up there for me. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look, the first time you were born, you were born in Adam. You were born in sin. You were born like Jacob. But there's a new birth in Christ. And then when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And I know that it doesn't happen overnight. That's what this whole message was about. But at the same time, even though you may not be walking the way you want to, I'm here to tell you, if you're saved, the Bible says you already are a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. That's what the Lord sees. Amen. And he's going to keep working in you to get you to that place. You know what's so awesome about this passage? And we're closing with this. Genesis 32, verse 31. It says, and as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him. And he halted or he limped on his thigh. You know, Jacob never walked the same. I don't know what it looked like. I'm not going to try to imitate it, but he, he was limping. He, he never walked the same. And I know that might sound like a negative connotation. Well, I don't want to walk around limping, but you know what? One thing that I, I, I would believe is that a man with a limp, he's not trusting in himself anymore. He's completely become dependent upon the Lord. He'll, and he'll never forget his walk was never the same. When we come to the Lord, our walk will never be the same. When we surrender to the Lord, our walk will never... I didn't, I'm not talking about perfect, uh, perfection. There was only one who walked perfect on the earth. I'm talking about your walk will never be the same when you come to the Lord. Amen.